But we're in a series on purpose. How many of you are here for week one of that series? Anybody? A couple of you. That's good. I'm going to review anyway. So we're in a series on purpose. And I believe that purpose is vitally important. It's vitally important that you and I understand that we are here on purpose for a purpose. If you don't have a purpose for your life and you don't know that there's a purpose for your life, you'll wander around your life aimlessly with no sense of direction. And unfortunately, in all our culture and in our generation today, there are so many people that are walking around with no sense of purpose. that are walking around every single day, lacking vision and lacking a direction for their lives. And I believe that we're called to change that. How many of you want to walk with purpose and you want to have direction for your life? I, I want that wholeheartedly. Mark Twain said this, and I love this quote. He said, the two most important days of your life are the day that you're born and the day that you find out why. Isn't that so true? It's so vitally important that we find out why, because I believe that God has a specific purpose for each and every one of us. If you turn with me, we're going to start where we left off last week in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11, and it says this, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that God knows the plans that he has for me, that his plans for me are good, and that I can know that I have a confident expectation. I can have a knowing that his future for me is good. I'm so thankful for that. Psalm 136, verse 16, it says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book, and every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. What an amazing passage of scripture, because it's basically letting us know that God had our entire life planned out before we even breathed our first breath. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. But I found that he has every day of our lives ordained and every day written in a book, but some people aren't in the right book. Some people aren't in the right chapter of the book and some people aren't on the right page. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in the right book. I want to be in the right chapter, and I want to be on the right page, step by step, in His will for my life, and His purpose for my life. I believe that's vitally important. So we said these three things last week. If you're not here, you can go ahead and jot these down. Just going to review these really quickly. We said these three things. First, that God has a plan. I'm so thankful that God has a plan, that He knows the plan, that I don't have to figure out the plan for my own life but God has the plan. That means that I don't decide the plan for my life, I just discover it. How do I discover it? I discover it by growing in my relationship with Jesus and walking day in and day out with him. So it makes it really simple. I can take the pressure off of myself of trying to come up with my own plan. How many of you ever tried to come up with your own plan for your life? And you might have thought, man, that kind of led me to a dead end. That kind of led me to a place where I'm completely confused. Some of you maybe started a major And then you switch that major, and then you switch that major, and then you switch that major again, and then time number six, you're like, man, I'm just tired of paying for school. And uh, I believe that the plan of God for your life can be discovered, but it is a journey of discovering it with God. The second thing is simply this, God's plan for your life is good. God's plan for your life is good. So many people mistake things that God does for things the enemy is actually doing. And and anything bad that has come against you in your life, can I encourage you? God didn't do it. God will use it, but he didn't do it. And so if we don't identify God as good, we'll think that bad things happening to us are actually God trying to teach us a lesson, when in fact God has a plan, and that plan is for good. I'm so thankful today that God has a plan for my life, that every day of my life was written in a book before a single day was lived out, and that that plan is good. The the third thing is simply this. The third thing, if you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write this down, is God doesn't change his mind about his plan for you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how bad you've messed up, God does not change his mind about his plans for you. In fact, the Bible says that the plans and the callings of God, they're irrevocable. They're without repentance. He doesn't take them away. And I'm so thankful today that my mistakes don't mean that God's done with me. My mistakes don't mean that God's plan for me has changed. My mistakes only make it more evident that I need his grace and only make it more evident who's going to get the glory when things go well. 
because my life is a testament of his grace and it speaks to his glory. And I think that each and every one of us are called to be expressions of his grace to our world, to shine a light on his glory because he's the one who purposed us in the first place. So I have about, man, 12 minutes, 12 minutes. If you can give me 12 minutes, can everybody give me 12 minutes, 12 minutes to talk to you really quick? Worship went a little long, and I understand. You're in the heat of school right now. You're in the heat of the battle. And uh, so I get it. The struggle is real. And so we're going to help you get out of here at 1030. So maybe you can hang out for about 15 minutes and get to know some people and then head out. But just a shameless plug for community. Um, grab yourself some coffee or some water and just chill out for a minute. Uh, but I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as I can. But there's a couple things that, man, I want to get across to you when it comes to the purpose of God for your life. And I believe there are two things tonight that, that I was just impressed to share with you about two things that are important for you to stay the course, two things that you're going to have to have to do in order to stay the course. Are there more than two? Probably. Are these two really important ones? Definitely. But we're just going to share two tonight for the sake of time. Two things that I believe are vitally important for you to stay the course, two keys to stay the course. The first one is focus on the now, not the next. Focus on the now, not the next. I found that when it comes to God's purpose for my life, the enemy of me focusing on what I'm called to do right now in this season can be the distraction of what I think I might be called to do in the next season. Sometimes the enemy of me being faithful with what God's trusted in my hand now is me being too focused on what he might be calling me to do next. Sometimes the key to me being focused and faithful in the opportunity that he's given me that I have is getting my eyes off of the opportunity that I think I should have next. See, if we're not focused on now, a lot of us will naturally gravitate towards next. And I think the reason that so few are faithful in the now is because they're constantly looking, what am I going to do next? I had a phone conversation with somebody just this week. And uh, they were talking to me about, man, I, I just don't know. Like, I know that I'm doing what, what, what I've been doing for the last few years and you know, I just don't feel that fulfilled doing it anymore. I feel like there might be, a, might be a change, but I just don't know what to do next. I, I just don't know what I'm called to do next. I know what I'm doing now, but I don't know what I'm called to do, to do next. And to be honest, it's been distracting me from doing what I need to do now. And I'm having trouble focusing on my job right now, and I'm having trouble uh, pouring my heart into my job right now because I've been thinking so much and, and like, do you think I need to fast? Do you think I need to, to like take an extended time like from work, just get quiet and pray? What do you think I need to do? And I just was honest with them, and I'm gonna be honest with you tonight. For, for me, it's never looked like an extended time fasting and praying. There are times for that and there are places for that. And usually it is so you can surrender your will to his. And usually it is so you can put your flesh under. But I've never needed to navigate the next season through, through fasting. For me, that just isn't how it's worked. Through me, it hasn't been some uber spiritual, like make me look crazy spiritual deal. I have never really been one to over-spiritualize in my life. I feel like God, God can work through me just being a normal Christian. And I'm not saying that if you fast, you're not. I think fasting is a good discipline in its context, for sure. But, but he was putting so much pressure on himself for this decision that he felt this, this pressure that he needed to make right now. And it was causing him to, to look at what's next and, and neglect what's, what's now. I said to him, man, honestly, how it's looked for me is I've just always focused on what God's given me now to do and just trusted that I'm going to throw my all into it. I'm not going to lift my head up. I'm not going to look around for other opportunities that could be better, but I'm just going to keep my head down in this. And at a certain point, I, I believe God will tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, I, I need you over here. And I'll just be led by the, the peace of God into that place, but, but I'm going to keep moving. 
I'm going to keep going off of what he last told me to do. And I'm going to keep moving in that direction. And I believe that the number one reason that most people fail in the opportunity to be faithful today is because they stop moving. They stop doing what God's called them to do right now. They want to do something different. They don't want to do the right now. And so they stop moving. They stay stagnant. They get complacent. And I heard somebody say this one time, and I think it's such a great example. They said, man, it's easier for God to steer a moving car than it is for him to steer one with the emergency brake on. See, sometimes when we feel change, we turn the emergency brake on and we're like, God, steer my life. I'm afraid to make any move right now. I'm afraid to even keep moving in the same direction. I'm afraid to keep being faithful because you're calling me to something better. Let me, let me back out of everything that I'm doing currently so that, so that I can move to something better. And it's like, you're completely still. You're stagnant. You're complacent. You're not moving anywhere. And I believe that we have to look sometimes at what was the last instruction God gave you and are you still following it? What was the last thing he told you to do? See, I've seen this being a pastor. I've seen this with people being planted in church. It's like all of a sudden they think that there's this, this thing coming in their future that, that is going to be a great opportunity. Or they feel like, man, I might be called to go to, to this great church over here. And, and so, but God hasn't provided the funds for me to go there yet. So, so I'm just kind of waiting here and they fail to ever dig their roots in and they fail to ever be faithful or they think this big job is coming, this big break is coming. And so they start to back off. They instantly, they were planted for a season maybe, but they start to instantly back off. Why? Because I'm not going to be here that much longer. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be around. I'm not going to be doing this. So, so why would I stay faithful? Why would I stay planted? And then three years later, you look up and they're still sitting there and they haven't grown at all. They haven't grown spiritually. They haven't grown in what God's called them to do. The gifts and graces that he's placed in them. Why? Because they thought there was something bigger, a big break down the road, and they got stagnant rather than continuing to move. See, I believe that God wants us to stay moving. I don't believe for one second that God has called us to be complacent or stagnant or put the emergency break on, so to speak. I believe that he's called us to constantly be moving, to constantly be consistent, to constantly be focused on what he last told us to do until we get the next instruction. If you're in here tonight and you haven't gotten the next Next thing from God. Maybe the one thing that he's calling you to do right now is get planted into church and stay there. To get planted in a house where your gifts will flourish. The Bible says that those who are planted in the house of the Lord, they'll flourish in the courts of our God. Maybe the first step for you is to get planted and just stay there and watch God start to move and pull things out of you that you never knew were there. Watch him start to, to elevate you in your sphere, wherever that is, the business world or wherever it may be, because you decide to get planted. But that was the first step of obedience. It looked small. It looked insignificant. Didn't look like it moved the needle at all towards what you were doing, but it was the first direction that it gave you. And I just want to encourage you, if you, you stay stagnant, if you get complacent, you put the e-brake on rather than moving in that direction that he told you, you'll find yourself years from now wondering what if and what happened. And I don't want to spend my life wondering what if and what happened. I want to be obedient to what God said. If you don't know what to do, focus on what you know to do. If you don't know what to do next, focus on what you know to do now. So there are things that God says in his word that we can be obedient to right now. That's why I think a daily devotion life is so vitally important. Because every time I read the word, I see something that I can do right now today. Something that I can apply right now today. We're getting really practical with this, but man, that's, that's the basics. Like, I see something that I can tweak and get better in every single day. So there's no time for stagnance. There's always movement. There's no time to just be potted in a church. It's a time to get planted. I want to celebrate the fact that we had 55 high school and college students last week go through Starting Point, 47 of which went ahead and signed up for an area. That's amazing. Can I challenge you now? The biggest challenge, if you did go through starting point, is going to be to actually plant. Because we see a lot of people go through starting point. We see a lot of people sign a paper, but we don't see a lot of people get planted. See, signing a paper isn't, isn't where it ends. Getting planted is where it, where it actually begins. Like, you sign the paper, but get planted. 
Why? Because God's called you to plant here. And if you're waiting for a less busy season to get planted, you'll be waiting for the rest of your life. And I believe that God's called all of us to be a part of a local church. I believe that fundamentally we are each, every one of us are called to get involved and get planted in a local church. And I know I'm going off on that. And you're like, man, this is just pastor talk. No, this is Jesus follower talk. If I weren't a pastor at all, I would get up here. Well, I probably wouldn't, but I would tell you the same thing. I'd tell you the same thing. Get planted in the house of God. It's where you'll see giftings come out that you didn't know you had. It's where you'll see people recognize stuff in you and call things out of you that you didn't know were there. And it's where you will experience community and God's blessing and his favor will be on your life when you're obedient to do what he said. So focus on the now and not just the next. Can I ask you, what's the last thing God called you to do? What's the thing he's dealing with you right now to do that you're not currently doing? What now that you have control over that you can actually do, do you need to do rather than focusing on the next? Because a lot of times, even being in ministry, if I'm honest, I've seen so many youth pastors that I talk to. I've seen so many people in ministry that I talk to focused on what they're doing next. And it's kept them from being truly faithful in what they're called to do now. You can't be fully faithful in what you're doing now if you're not diligent there, if you're not all in there with your mind and with your heart, all in, both feet, dove in to what God's called you to do now. So I believe we've got to focus on the now and not the next. And the second thing is simply this, I believe that we need to be committed to what God called us to do. And I want to phrase this differently. You need to be committed to what God called you to do. Be committed to what God called you to do. What do I mean by that? You're like, obviously, obviously, I should be committed to what God called, called me to do. But I believe if you're committed to what God called you to do, you won't compare your lane to other people's lane. I'll never forget this one time I, I ran cross country in 10th grade. I kind of got conned into it. Anybody run cross country in high school? Anybody? A few of you. God bless you, it's terrible. Um, I ran cross country because my basketball coach kind of conned me into it. My basketball coach was a salesman and he was like, we really need you to run. They need you to run so we can have a team. So I'm kind of a people pleaser anyway. So I started to, to run cross country. And uh, I had never run cross country in my life. I had no idea even like what it entailed. I had no idea anything about cross country. I just knew that I was running so we could have a team. Man, I get to the first race, and literally I don't even have a uniform yet. I get to the first race, and they hand me this uniform, and the first thing that I notice is the shorts are missing quite a bit of fabric. Like, there should be at least three extra inches on those things for them to be legal for me to wear. And it's like 30 degrees outside, and I'm like, these should be outlawed in most states. That's terrible. And so I put them on, I put the tank top on, and I'm like ready to go. I'm like, all right. High school me, here we go. And so I get in this large crowd of people, the gun goes off, and I'm off to the races. And I'll never forget, I'm looking to my right and my left, and I'm seeing these people come out of the gate. And I'm like, man, this isn't so tough. My goodness, I found myself at the front of the pack. And I'm thinking, why are all these people so slow? This is crazy. These people are slow. They've been running this race. They've been running races like this their whole lives. Some of these people are like winning state in certain things. And I know the state leaders. I, I identify one of them is on my team. I run past him. I'm like, dude, piece of cake. This is crazy. Here I am. I've arrived. This is great. All of a sudden, like, we get a little bit into this race, and I feel like I might die. Like. I have a side cramp on both sides. Like everything's starting to hurt. And I look up and there's the three quarter mile marker. And it's a 3.1 mile race. I thought to myself, oh no. I think I've made a very big mistake. See, I started running based on what I saw everybody else doing and outrunning them rather than running at the pace, I didn't realize that that guy at the side of the track that had the stopwatch for me, my coach, he was timing my time based on how I had run 
in practice based on what, what my capacity to run was at that time. He was checking my times. And so the first mile, he's looking at me like, son, what did you eat? This is wonderful. By the third mile, he's like, where are you? We're gonna lose. Where are you? And I was walking. So we got to the second mile, and at the second mile, there was this hill, and it was really steep. And so I found myself on all fours, crawling up this hill, because my legs are fried at this point. And I looked to my right when I got to the top of this hill, and there, was a wa there were a bunch of water fountains. And I thought, oh, the heavens open, and there's water. This is great. So I walked off the course. How many of you know when you do something dumb, usually you have one friend that will follow you? Well, the point guard from our basketball team, I was the shooting guard, he was the point guard. The point guard from our basketball team goes ahead and decides he's gonna follow me over to the water fountain. So now we're not just like, not only is our team doing really poorly, but we have two people that have completely left the race. <laughs> and so we begin to walk the rest of the course and we've passed this passed out kid. And so I was like, well, I guess at least we beat one person by default. It's rough. So we, we were walking and all of a sudden we got about 100 feet from the finish line and I decided to go into a dead sprint just so I could say that I beat him but the only person that he beat was a passed out kid. Needless to say, that day our coach wasn't very happy because I didn't realize that the race that I ran actually affected the rest of the team. I didn't realize that how I ran my race affected the people on my right and on my left that were my teammates. I didn't know that cross country was a team sport. I really didn't. I thought it was individuals running to see who won the race. And once I knew that I wasn't even close to winning the race, I just bowed out. I think some of us, if we're honest, we're the same way in our lives. We compare ourselves to everyone else that's running. And can I tell you that looking side to side, when you should be looking straight ahead at Jesus, who is the pace setter, the Bible says that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible compares our lives to a race. And it says that we do this by keeping our eyes. How do we run? How do we lay aside the sin? How do we keep running our race well? By looking at the pace setter. Jesus, who authors and finishes our faith. That's how we run our race. And you can't run this race well if you're looking side to side to the back or down. You have to keep your head up, keep your eyes on Jesus, allow him to set your pace, allow him to dictate the opportunities that you get. You aren't responsible for the opportunities that someone else gets. You're only responsible for what you get. You aren't responsible for someone else's leadership capacity. You're only responsible for your leadership capacity. You are not responsible to run someone else's race in their lane. You're only responsible to run your race in your lane. And if you're constantly looking at other people's lanes, at other people's races, as if they're more important or more desirable than yours, you'll fail to ever do what it is that God's called you to do with diligence. See, if you look as if theirs is more desirable, you'll fa fail to be diligent in the race that you have. And I, don't, I believe that wholeheartedly that you're here at 1030 at night because you want to do this. You want to run your race with efficiency. You want to know that, man, I'm running my race and I'm doing, doing well at it. So I believe one thing that'll happen when we're committed to our, our race is we'll stop comparing ourselves to other people's race. When we're committed to our call, we'll stop the comparison. I believe the other thing that'll happen when we're committed is we'll stop chasing opportunities that look better and we'll just stay consistent and committed to our call. Because the enemy of you staying committed to what God's called you to do. Can I tell you, I talked about this a little bit last week. The world needs more committed people. The church needs more committed people who say, I'm just going to commit. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to serve the vision of the house when the vision of the house doesn't serve me. I'm going to serve God when I don't feel like serving God. I'm going to do what he said to do when I don't feel like doing what he said to do. I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to be committed and I'm not just going to go wherever the opportunity looks like it's better, but I'm going to stay right where he called me to be. 
See, you will constantly have to fight your eyes going to greener pastures when really the greener pastures, they're just a lie and they're just a deception to distract you from the grass that you should be watering right in front of you that is your calling, that takes commitment, that take con takes consistency, that takes grind, and it takes grace. But if you're looking for the greener pastures, you'll always find them, but you'll just see a green pasture and what you don't see is the person that's actually watering. The worst place for this is social media, is it not? We see the 30% of people's lives that they want us to see that makes it look super glamorous. It makes it look amazing when really it's not that amazing. And so we think, man, if I could just have what they have, man, if I could just go, I've heard people say this, man, if I could just go, oh, If I could just go to a church like Hillsong or a church like Elevation, and can I tell you I love Hillsong and I love Elevation. I'll be the first one to be blaring Hillsong worship and Elevation worship in my car all the time, 24-7. I love both of those churches. I love the pastors of those churches. They're people that I listen to. They're people that I love. But here's something that happens, and I see it all the time. Oh, if I could go to a church like that, I'd get planted right away. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. You'd find an excuse there too. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to just look for a movement that's already established to join on to, but I wanna be part of building a movement. There's nothing wrong with becoming a part of that. There's nothing wrong with that if that's where you're called, but if you're called to a house, there is something about being a part. I've always said, God, let me be a part of building something that, that ricochets through regions, that, that, that moves people, that's a movement that people are talking about, that people even outside of that region are like, what is going on in Canton, Ohio? What is happening there? And I believe that that only happens. Those types of moves of God only happen when people decide, man, I'm not gonna look for greener pastures, but I'm gonna water this pasture. I'm gonna be found faithful. I don't wanna be found, I just wanna be found faithful. I don't want to look for something better that I can compare to. I just wanna be committed and I wanna be consistent and I wanna focus on what I'm called to do. If you'll be consistent and you'll be committed and you'll leave the results in God's category, He'll always exceed your expectations. But you have to be committed and you have to be consistent. My prayer for each and every one of us in here tonight is that we would be that church, that we would be that committed, that we would be that consistent in a world, in a culture where that is not normal, that we would be countercultural and decide, man, when the vision doesn't serve me, still serving the vision. When I don't feel like it, I'm still gonna be committed. See, commitment, it's staying the course. Even after the feeling that you started with has long left you, it's staying the course. Some of you need to remind yourself why you started so that you remember why you need to stay in it, stay consistent, stay committed. Can we?